Good morning, church. I'm going to invite you all to stand with us as we begin worship. everybody. Happy Mother's Day. I'm Brady. Before we continue with worship this morning, we wanted to give you a look at some things happening here at Friendship. 
Summer is almost here, our ministry is ramping up again, and that means plenty of opportunities to serve. You've got the opportunity to work with Sunday school kids, summer kids on Wednesday nights, the soup kitchen, and many other great places to use your gifting. If you'd like to serve, talk with Pastor Todd today or email us at info at friendshipbc.com. All the work of mission and ministry here at Friendship is made possible because of your regular budgeted giving. When you give to the work here at Friendship, you help our church family accomplish its goals, meet spiritual and physical needs, not only here, but out in our communities. And the easiest way to give is through our online portal at friendshipbc.com give. Well, thanks again for being with us. If you have questions about anything that you've heard today, or if you just want to find out more about the church, please talk with one of our pastors or go to friendshipbc.com to learn more about our church. Good morning, church. Good morning. We are so excited. Do you want to know why? <laughs> thanks, Nate. We're excited because we're doing baptisms today, and there's... No better way to celebrate Mother's Day with some baptisms. And what's really cool is we're actually starting with somebody who is a mother. Uh, so I'm going to have Karen come down. We're going to start with her. Before she's baptized, we actually get to hear her story and Diane's story. Hi, my name is Karen, and this is my daughter, Diane. I grew up going to a Congregational Methodist Church. I was taught that if I was a sinner, that my soul could never go to heaven. I fell away as soon as I was allowed to stop going. I still believed in God, even though I stopped going to church. It wasn't until one of my daughters was baptized here four years ago that the Holy Spirit started to awaken my faith. It wasn't until about two months ago during worship that God spoke to me through a song that that right then and there, I knew I was a child of God. At that point, I knew I wanted to be baptized to show the world my faith. Diane, and this is Diane's. Diane has been going, coming to faith, friendship longer than I have. We have seen her quietly listening and taking in the truth over the years. We have been able to communicate to her about our Savior. Although she, she doesn't say much, we do know that she believes and in, in, that Jesus is her Savior, and she wanted to be baptized too. Glory to God. Karen, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Yes. And through your faith, do you want to tell the world that you are His? Yes. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He said it's warm. <laughs> He told her she could go slow, and literally she is. <laughs> we got time. <laughs> right, buddy? One more set. And touchdown. Oh, it's actually warm. I made it warm for you. <laughs> All right. Can you say hi to everyone? You see your family out there? You wave to them? There they are. Remember when I put it, do this? You want to plug your nose? You want to plug your nose too? Wait. Well, actually, we'll have her say. You answer my question before you plug your nose. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> All right, Diane. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes. And through your baptism, do you want to tell the world that you are his? And I baptize you. And I baptize you in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, 
baby. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll go. Come on, I've got you. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There you go. That should be a smile. <laughs> All right, Martin. Going down. Are you excited? Maybe your family is all sitting over here. We're actually going to hear Martin's story too. Hi, my name is Martin Pierce. Uh, a few years back, I've always remembered my cousin. When I would see him, he would always ask me, have you read or prayed today? And I'll be like, uh, you know, I'll get to it later. Until one day he said to me, you just can't worship or praise him on and off or when you feel like it, it has to be an everyday thing. And when he said that, uh, something clicked to me. It really stuck to me. So from that point on, I became consistent at reading and praying. So from that point on, I can say that I started my walk as a Christian. So the reason why I want to be baptized is because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I feel like it's it's a calling. I had a feeling come over me a few few weeks ago to maybe a month ago, and kept on saying in my head, you know, baptize, baptize, you know, be baptized. So I started looking for a church home to be baptized in, so that I could continue my walk with Christ. Amen. Martin, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. And through your baptism, do you want to tell the world that you are His? Yes, sir. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, church. I'll tell you, these, uh, these Sundays are the best Sundays of all when we see people getting baptized. Uh, what a blessing it is, not just for them, but for all of us. And continue to keep them in prayer uh, throughout this coming week. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. And uh, I'm going to start the call to worship with our New City Catechism. This week we are in question number 19. And what I like about this is that you'll notice, if you've been following along with these, that last week the uh, catechism asked us if there was a punishment for sin. And it said, absolutely, there is a punishment. And let's see how that carries on to week 19, where the question is, is there any way to escape punishment and be brought back into God's favor? And the answer is yes. To satisfy his justice, God himself, out of mere mercy, reconciles us to himself and delivers us from sin and from the punishment for sin by a redeemer. And I want you to notice that very last word, redeemer, because next week we're going to talk about who that redeemer is. Uh, before we uh, get into prayer this morning, I would like to read a very short poem and uh, you'll know, and I think you know what, who this is for. It says, God took the fragrance of a flower, the majesty of a tree, the gentleness of morning dew, the calm of a quiet sea, the beauty of the twilight hour, the soul of a starry night, the laughter of a rippling brook, the grace of a bird in flight. Then God fashioned from these things, a creation like no other, and when his master of peace was through, he simply called it mother. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for our moms and for all the mothers throughout the world, Lord God. Such an important role that they play. And Lord God, we, we just ask that you would help us men to support those women in our lives that are our moms or our mothers to our children. Lord, may we honor them and praise them for what they mean, not just to us, but to the children in our families, Lord God. We are so thankful for this church and, Lord God, for the ministries of this church. 
And Lord, we thank you for these baptisms this morning and for the child dedications that will, file, uh, will follow. Lord, what a beautiful time it is to just listen to these wonderful sounds of music that we lift up with our voices and with these instruments to you. And Father, we pray this morning for Pastor as he brings the message that the words of the scriptures would be loud and clear, not just in our minds, but in our hearts as well. We thank you for all this in the wonderful and the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You'll stand with us as we continue to sing. I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls
working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Morning again, church. Uh, what a great day to spend with baptisms, and we're even going to be able to do some child dedications this morning. Um, and although we might think it's about the children, it's as much about the parents. And child dedications really are a public commitment made by parents. It's making a promise to offer our children to the Lord. It's a public commitment. Uh, to dedicate themselves to rearing their child for the glory of God. It's also for us as their family to commit support and encourage and hold them accountable in their parenting journey. And this is not a sacrament of any kind, of course. It's not to impart salvation to the child. I don't think Francesca's very excited about being dedicated this morning. <laughs> Poor baby. <laughs> she saw me come and she's like, no. Dedication, of course, is the commitment of the parents to God uh, to raise the child in a new covenant home, uh, ultimately pointing them, of course, to Jesus. So I want to invite the families who are dedicating their children this morning, we have three, uh, to come on up, and we also have some representatives from our church who are going to be praying for them this morning.
have you guys, other guys start, we'll move it down this way. She heard me, and she's like, I'm going to do it for my favorite pastor. Right over here, guys. Uh, we're going to actually start by having um, representatives from our church pray for each of the families in turn. We'll start with uh, Jeremiah and Hope, and then we'll move our way down through. But we'll pass it down. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning to pray for Stephanie and Ashley, Lord, and uh, little Francesca, Lord. I pray, Father, you just continue to guide and direct them as they raise her. I pray, Father, for a hedge of protection around her and the family. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would just, uh, just show your grace to this family through this dedication. And I pray, Lord, you would guide and direct them all the days of her life. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we thank you for Dan and Brittany and for their love for you. And Lord, we just ask that you continue to grow that love for you and for each other and that their marriage would be a place of res refuge for their children. And as they grow closer to you, that they dedicate their children today. And I know uh, Levi has already been dedicated, but we ask specifically for Lily today. And we pray that she grows up into just a woman who loves you and who knows you and who honors you. And, and thank you for the chance to pray for them. And as a church, Lord, we just commit ourselves to this family and we commit ourselves to helping them to raise these children in a way that uh, honors you and glorifies you. And in any way, we can support and love them, Lord. And uh, thank you for the graciousness of your salvation in your name. Amen. I hope you girls know how blessed you are to have a mom and dad that you have. Amen. Let's pray. I pray that you surround Izzy and Rosie, Lord God, with good things so that they may grow in your will and your ways. I pray for Ian and Rachel. Fill them with wisdom so that they may train these girls in the way that they should go so that even when they are old, they will not depart from it. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start with Ian and Rachel. I'm going to ask them four questions. Yeah, I am. <laughs> and uh, I just want you to respond with I will. Will you pray for your children? Will you instruct your children in the way of the Lord? Will you be a living example of Christ to them? And will you promise never to break their spirit? I will. Thank you. For Dan and Brittany and Lily. Will you pray for your child? Will you instruct your child in the way of the Lord? Will you be a living example of Christ to them? And will you promise never to break their spirit? I will. I will. And Stephanie Nash with Francesca. Will you pray for your child? Will you instruct your child in the way of the Lord? Will you be a living example of Christ to her? Will you promise never to break her spirit? I will. I will. All right, let's pray together for these families. Our God, we're so thankful for all of the families and the legacies represented here. We ask your deep blessing upon them today. Uh, Lord, on this Mother's Day, that you might be glorified in these families. And for all these babies, Lord, we are so thankful for them. We're thankful for all the little ones, for all the noise, for all the mess, for all the chaos. We praise you for them because they are alive and they bring life to us. And we just pray a deep blessing upon them through Christ. Amen. Thanks, gang. You can have a seat. You got it, buddy. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39, and as you're turning there, I'll pray for our time. Our Lord and our God, we ask that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful truth from your word. We ask that you would, by your spirit, teach our hearts to believe this word and to live in the hope of your promises and your person. We ask that you would make the book live to us, Lord. 
We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 39, I'm going to read verse 1 through 10. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he's put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day, He would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. This is God's Word. Uh, One of my very favorite John Mellencamp songs, or John Cougar, or John Cougar Mellencamp, however you remember him. Um, If you were from the 70s or 80s, I think it was John Cougar, then John Cougar Mellencamp, then now John Mellencamp. Anyway, John Mellencamp, his song, Small Town, one of my favorites. I was born in a small town. Taught the fear of Jesus in a small town. Going to die in a small town. Ah, that's probably where they'll bury me. My wife and I come from a small town. Our high school had about 300 kids in it. Our graduating class was 30. I was in the top half of my class. (laughs) Our entire town had about 1,500 people in it. Still does. It's still a pretty small town. Well, minus us, of course. I didn't start to travel extensively for work until I was in my mid-twenties. I still remember the first time I stepped out of Penn Station in Manhattan, climbed those steps to the surface, this young hick kid from the northern wilds of New Hampshire wearing his new suit, starting his job down on 67 Wall Street. I came out at Penn Station to the surface, and I was just bombarded by the sights and the smells and the sounds and the people of one of the largest cities in the world. It was absolutely overwhelming. Then, of course, trying to ride a cab from Midtown down to downtown is an adventure all in itself. But imagine that Joseph had the same reaction as he entered into the Nile Valley as a young man. He's likely in his late teens at this point. He's always lived a Bedouin lifestyle. He was a shepherd. He lived in tents. And here he was now entering in chains, of course, the biggest, busiest metropolitan area of his day. The architecture alone was spectacular, the massive pyramids, uh, which would have just left him stunned. And then, of course, add all the palaces and the markets and all of the people. The 15th dynasty of Egypt was in full swing, and every morning as the sun rose, everyone in the city would go to their windows and they they would chant their cultic hymns to awaken the many gods from their slumber. The statues of Egypt's, the idols basically, would line the streets and the homes, and every morning, all of these statues had to be ritualistically bathed and enclosed before they were given their breakfast as a morning offering. The god of Memphis, of course, would likely have idols lining the streets. The schools would be watched over by the god of learning, who is Hermopolis, and Pharaoh was considered a god by his subjects. He was the embodiment of the sky god Horus. All of this assaulted the young man Joseph's senses as he stood alone just trying to take it all in. And Joseph was in the epicenter of spiritual darkness. He was bought by an aristocrat, Potiphar, which is the equivalent maybe today of being bought by a deputy mayor who lives in a penthouse in the third tallest building 
in Manhattan. Joseph went from the desert to the height of opulence in Egyptian culture, from small town to big city. In all of this, of course, he was tested. Joseph could have quite easily lost himself lost his family heritage, lost the prophetic nature of his dreams. He could have simply assimilated into the culture and indulged in it all. He could have even indulged in Potiphar's wife, likely without recourse, and lived a very successful, well-fed, and rich life. However, God was with him. And when God is with you, that changes everything about how you think, act, and react. Not only to the good things in life, but to the challenging things as well. So today, there's two big ideas that I want to consider revolving around the very real presence of God Himself. Let's start with the fact that God was with Joseph. One of the most familiar names of Jesus is Emmanuel. We sing it at Christmas time. Jesus is our Emmanuel. It's a combination of two Hebrew words. Put together, they mean God with us. The Gospel of Matthew explains that Christ received that name in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. For many people, the name Emmanuel has a nice ring to it and perhaps suggests comfort and hope in times of trouble. But there's a lot more substance and significance to it than just that. The encouragement Christians can take from this name is not a a mere vague impression or passing emotionalism. The truth conveyed by the name of Jesus has both a glorious beauty and a wide range of blessings associated with it. Even, of course, prior to the incarnation, God was with His people, as we see in our text. In verse 2, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. And what was the result? He became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Joseph has double success in this chapter, not only with Potiphar, but when he's eventually thrown in prison. And each time it's preceded by declarations that the Lord was with him. Both in the house of Potiphar, of course, later as he is a prisoner and he comes to power there as well. God was with him. The theological centerpiece, of course, of this chapter is not Joseph, it's God himself. And his covenantal promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now we see them manifest in Joseph. God was present and working on Joseph's behalf. Not only that, God promised to bless those who bless Abraham and his descendants. And here we see that promise kept to this man, Potiphar, who was not a man of the covenant and not a man of the living God. In the most uncertain times of Joseph's young life, when he could see nothing of the true living God, the covenant God of Israel was at work to effect the covenant promises through Joseph. Alone in this grand penthouse of Potiphar with the intimidating architecture of Egypt, dwarfing him, making him feel rather small and without any value, Joseph was not alone. God was with him to do this mighty work for his covenant people and a blessing to the world. And as a result, Joseph experienced spectacular, surprising success and elevation. He was bought a slave. He was quickly made the chief servant over all the affairs of the house. The Lord was with Joseph, not just in Egypt, but his entire life. Joseph's birth was a miracle. The Lord was with him when he dreamed that one day his family would bow down to him. The Lord was with him when his brothers, in jealous rage, threw him in an empty well and left him for dead. The Lord was with him in the pit. Joseph wasn't alone there in the dark. The Lord was with him when he was taken out of the pit and when he pleaded with his brothers not to sell him as a slave to the Ishmaelites. And the Lord was still with him even when they did. And then Joseph in chains had to march all the way to Egypt, which would have been like walking from here to Norfolk, Virginia. But the Lord was with him. And then he would stand in the slave market in Egypt to be sold again. Joseph did not understand the why of his suffering, but it appears that he trusted in his God. God was with Joseph not only all of his life, but specifically when he was tempted by the wife of his master. I mean, he couldn't just quit his job to escape this temptation. It was a repeated temptation. This is a temptation that would have been much easier for Joseph just to give into. This was a par- perfect opportunity for him. No one was in the house. It, it, likely his, his master didn't even care. The temptation came when Joseph was away from home and 
you could say away from church, you could, and all of his thinking was from his small town. But now he had this relatively unbridled freedom from the restraints of his childhood. However, Joseph, even away from home, even in chains, even accused as he was, he knew the living God. And that didn't change. God was with Joseph. Second then, we need to consider the fact that God is with us. In the fullness of time, God would take on human flesh to bring His presence to us. Jesus Christ is an incarnate Savior. That's the beauty of God with us. Jesus didn't come as an angel or some uh, spirit manifesting Himself from time to time. He took on bone of bone and flesh of flesh. No other type of faith or world religion can give such comfort and hope that our Savior became like us to experience what we experience to then die in our place as our substitute. And Because the Son of God took on Himself our nature, there are many blessings that are represented by this. One of the great promises of the Great Commission, Jesus tells us, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them. But then the promise is, I'm going to be with you always to the end of the age. This isn't a do-it-yourself under your own power deal. This is God is with us to the end of the age. If Christ, if you are in Christ, God is with you. God was, wasn't with Joseph in some generic sense as most Americans might think today. Like, God bless America. And even those who don't know God or glorify Him as God can say, God bless America. It's a good thing. But if you're not in Christ, God's not with you. God was with Joseph through the promises of the covenant. If you are in Christ, God is with you through the promises of the new covenant. God is literally with you. When you are in Christ, when God is with you, there are, of course, a number of of quantifiable results. People say, oh, God is with me. But then they think in some generic uh, sense where it's just nice that God might be with us. Friends, if God is with you, you know it. Because there are quantifiable results. And here's the first. And the first is not pleasant. The first is you will become the object of Satan's schemes. Happy Mother's Day. I mean, that's the first deal, isn't it? In verse 7, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. I mean, if you know what I mean. This wasn't, well, you know what it is. And, and if you're growing in Christ, if you're taking responsibility for your discipleship, if you're part of a biblical church that is on mission, guess what? The, de- the devil doesn't like you. And he will seek to make you as ineffective as possible. I'm convinced The goal of the devil is to make most Christians as passive, lifeless, and irresponsible as possible. See, the devil isn't going to come to destroy you. He's going to come to encourage you to stay on the couch. That's how the devil attacks Christians. C.S. Lewis knew this best in his book, The Screwtape Letters, which I think everyone should read. It's a book of one-way letters from a senior demon to his nephew who is a lesser demon, and uh, the, the lesser demon's name is Wormwood. The senior demon's name is Screwtape. And they're writing back and forth about the subject. It's a man. A man that Wormwood must keep from the living God. And Uncle Screwtape says, it doesn't matter how small the sins are, provided their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into nothing. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft, underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. But the good news is that God is with us through Christ. But the New Testament repeatedly warns us of our adversary, the devil. Satan has a thousand years of, thousands of years, thousands of years of experience with people. And he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what will work and what won't work on me and what will and will not work on you to sideline you. Satan is not going to come at me with drink to sideline me, because it's never been a real struggle with me. Maybe it has been for you. It doesn't make me any better than you. It just means Satan's going to try something else with me. 
Satan can keep me, Todd Goulet, if he can keep me overextended, don't look at my family because they're going to start laughing, but if, if Satan can keep me overextended, incredibly busy, tired and worn out, he can keep me weary, he can keep me grumpy, he can keep me less effective and less likely to minister to someone or to pray or to read my Bible. Satan knows us well. Now a bit more cheerfully, the second result of God being with us is that we gain an increasing confidence in Him, in His Word, in His plans, in His providence. Joseph was repeatedly approached by this woman time and again, and then he went to prison for a long time. Now sometimes you're in a trial and it's hard, but it's short, and you find out that the really hard thing is dealing with intensity over time. A trial that seems to go on and on and on and on. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, and you begin to be worn down by it. Psalm 56 says, When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God, whose word I raise. In God, I have put my trust. King David, who is the writer of that psalm, has placed his faith in God alone. The content of David's faith is based upon God's word of promise to him. And so in the person of God and in the word of God, David places his faith. Joseph did the same thing. His confidence was rooted in God Himself and the promises that was made to His father and His grandfather and His great-grandfather. So we need to remind ourselves of the power of the One who we are praying to. Friends, we don't worship or serve mute idols, do we? We serve the living God. The living God that can handle all of your stuff. And I'm amazed by Christians who come to me and say, you don't even understand what's going on in my life. Or people who aren't in Christ says, you you don't want me at that church because you don't understand what's going on in my life. And they think I'm some sensitive sunflower and they're like, I can't tell you what's going on in my life because you'll faint. Probably not. I may not get it, but God does. The living God can handle all of your stuff. The third thing God does with this is that he can, we can increasingly trust in Him during our trials. Joseph trusts God in the middle of all this mess. Potter's wife tried to commit adultery with him. He wouldn't have it. He could have without recourse, I'm sure. Could have become a regular thing. But his integrity with God was his, and with his master prevented him. And of course, the wife lies and she makes up a story about Joseph. He tried to assault me and here's his cloak and now Joseph of course, is thrown in prison. Now, it doesn't seem like his his struggle is exactly spiritual. We tend to think of trusting God only in the big spiritual trials of our life. We must understand that God's providence and trusting in God can be done in every aspect of our life. Joseph really just needs to survive. Joseph could have been killed, but the circumstances become an occasion for him to trust and know God more deeply. And so if you're struggling with somebody at work that stabbed you in the back, or maybe in your neighborhood there's a real issue and serious conflict with a neighbor, or maybe you have a family situation where there's been some irreparable breach that doesn't feel particularly spiritual to you. Trust me, it is. Because even in those circumstances, God is coming to teach you about Himself. Who in here has a family that has struggles? You don't have to reach <laughs> everyone's hand went up. We all do. Welcome to the club. We meet every Sunday morning at 10.45 a.m. But even in that, God is coming to you to teach you about Himself, isn't He? And I want you to notice, Joseph learns about his God in the middle of his trouble, not after it's over. I mean, sometimes our attitude in trials is that we, need, we just need to get through it, and if God gets us through it, maybe then we'll learn a lesson or two. It's like the Homer Simpson prayer, I call it. I watch the Simpsons, don't judge me. Homer it was, was cascading off a cliff, and he's like, God, if you, if you save me, I'll go to church from now on. And of course, he, he lands safely, and he goes, hmm, I don't know what that was, and he just gets on with his life, as if nothing happened. That's not how it works. In the middle of the trial, it's in the depths of the pit that we come to know the living God. The fourth benefit of God is growing in integrity. Verse 8 
It says, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of my master has no concern about anything in the house, he's put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph is a kid, and he has growing integrity. God has us on a journey to transform our lives from how we are at our initial salvation to a life marked by Christian maturity. By His grace, God works in us throughout the seasons of our lives, in our success, in our failures, teaching us lessons about ourselves, about Himself, conforming us to the image of His Son. Proverbs 10 says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. The word integrity is a pretty important word in the book of Proverbs. A secure walk is not a matter of clever politics, but of personal integrity. But what is integrity? The Hebrew word really suggests completeness or wholeness or fullness. So no compromising, no breaches or gaps or refusals in the face of duty, but rather saying yes to the Lord moment by moment. The Lord gives all, He he claims all, and when we yield all, we walk securely. What does that look like? What does it look like to walk in integrity? I can tell you what it looks like for me. I don't know what it looks like for you. Here's what it looks like for me. It means that I realize that Jesus is the center of my story. I can tell you right now, there is no Todd Goulet without Jesus Christ. Today, without Jesus, I would likely be marrying my next ex-wife. Perhaps a cocaine-addled construction worker living in Alaska. Completely miserable, without my true bride, without my beautiful children, without the wonderful calling that God has given to me. Without Christ, there is no Todd Goulet. So integrity means that as a result of this, for me, I have utter loyalty to the whole Bible without apology to our culture. Not just from this spot, but in my whole life. Integrity means for me growing as a husband, a father, a pastor, fulfilling the responsibility of the roles that God has given me with a joyful heart. That is integrity in my life. Much more though, growing in integrity for me means a readiness to live in the providential care of God even when life doesn't look that good from an earthly perspective. Walking in this integrity, I walk securely. Fully armed against the schemes of the devil, entirely equipped to serve my family and my church in a way that honors God. God with us means we will grow in our own integrity in our way as it fills the shape of our lives. Your growth in integrity is going to look different than mine, but your integrity will be no different than mine. Because we're growing through the same Lord and Savior under the power of the same Holy Spirit because of the same salvation. The final result of God with us and maybe the greatest result is our ultimate glory. Jesus is God with us to reconcile sinners to God. I am a sinner reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Man is born alienated from God. And God can have no fellowship with man or woman because of sin. But Jesus gave His life as an offering so that sinners can be brought back into fellowship with God. And the benefits of of this in this lifetime, of course, are amazing. But what happens to us in the next is more than we can imagine. Romans 8, 29, those He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. Our glorification is really this amazing process that begins with our salvation and never really ends. Our sanctification is part of that glorification where we become more and more Christ-like in this life. And here's the deal. Often when we share the Gospel, we say things like, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Okay, that's part of all of this. But it it seems to be a reduction to me of the amazing glory that awaits us. First, our motivation for evangelism should be to see men and women reconciled to God now 
and in the life to come. But let me give you my best understanding of our glorification, which it actually culminates with our physical death. And here's the reality. There will come a day for every living person. There will come a day and a moment when you will die. Happy Mother's Day again. That's the reality of life though, isn't it? There will come a moment for every man and woman where we will face the moment of our death. What happens on that day is fully dependent on what you did with Jesus in this life. What happens to you on that day is fully dependent on what you do with the information that I'm going to share with you right now. That is the Gospel. Tim Keller says the Gospel. He says the Gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, but at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. And so I I always break the Gospel down into four parts. God, man, Jesus, and response. And we start with God. The Bible starts with God. The Gospel starts with God. We start with God. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything starts from that point. Because friend, if you believe you are nothing more than time plus matter plus chance, a product of evolutionary development, and what, what you do in this life doesn't mean anything, and then when you die you go into oblivion, then, then hey, just live your life. Because it doesn't matter anyway. Nothing matters. If we die and go into oblivion, who cares? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't Joseph just take advantage of all the pleasures of Egypt? However, if God created you, you were created with a purpose and an eternity. God created us. Therefore, He has the right to tell us how to live. And God is holy and just, and He's determined never to ignore or tolerate sin, even yours. And of course, you move from God to man. God created Adam and Eve, the very first human beings, And Adam and Eve were intended to live under His righteous joy in obeying Him, living in fellowship with Him. And quite frankly, had they not done what they'd done, they'd still be alive and we'd we'd be in Eden right now. We wouldn't have to deal with Connecticut drivers or Connecticut taxes or Connecticut roads or Connecticut roads. (laughs) But they did. They did the one thing God told them not to do. And of course, sin enters the world at that point. The fellowship with God was broken. They denied God's authority over their life. And of course, as their descendants, we inherit that from them. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. A forceful separation of our sinful, rebellious selves from the mercy of God forever. Then, of course, you move to Jesus. Jesus is the solution. When Jesus began His public ministry, He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And then as He dies on the cross, the awful weight of our sin falls on His shoulders and the sentence of death that God pronounces against rebellious sinners strikes and He dies for you and me. But the story doesn't end there. I mean, Jesus the crucified is no longer dead. The Bible tells us He rose from the grave. And Jesus' resurrection is God's way of saying everything that Jesus said about Himself is true. And so the question is, what is our response to this? Jesus says it must be repentance and faith. The only way to receive the benefits of what Jesus has done is through repentance and faith. All of what Jesus has done is of absolutely no value to you if you remain far from Him. We turn away from our sins and we turn towards God. Okay, so now the Bible says your eternity depends on what you do with that information. Do you reject Jesus? Or do you fall at His feet as Lord? If Jesus is your Lord, if you confess Christ as your Savior, as our friends did in the waters of baptism, that inevitable moment of physical death, I believe it will look like this. Well, I mean, it will be different. I mean, you might be in your car. In Connecticut, or you might be in the hospital, or just chilling. Maybe you're jumping out of a plane, which makes no sense to anyone. And the next moment you're standing in judgment before God. 
The Bible says it's appointed for a person to die once and then face judgment. You will not be reincarnated as a caterpillar. You're not going to go to a holding tank of purgatory to burn off your sins. It's not biblical. It was made up. You will die, and you will face judgment immediately. In Christ, what happened? Well, in that heavenly courtroom, as it were, you will be found guilty. But the sentence will be reversed because Jesus will be there and he will say, this one is mine. He is not guilty. I took his guilt. I paid his price. And from there, you'll be ushered into an eternity, a new heaven and a new earth, your ultimate and final glorification. Now, friends... We don't die, go to heaven, and fly around as fat little angel babies in diapers. We die, we go to heaven, and we are us, but perfected in the presence of God forever in a new heaven and a new earth, enjoying our lives as we do here, but eternally better. A new you, free from limitation, free from disease, free from Satan, sin, and death. That is our ultimate glorification. And God will truly be with you forever. The other option is that you reject Jesus in this life. You leave here and say, well, that was fun, but that guy's nuts. There's absolutely no way, there's absolutely no way that I would call Jesus my Savior. I'm good. I'm fine. I have wood stacked for three seasons. I have canned pickles for five. I'm fine. No, you stubborn, stiff-necked Yankee, you are not fine. That's rejecting Jesus. And so that day, at that moment of death, when you stand before God in the heavenly courtroom, you will be found guilty, but Jesus will not be there as your advocate. You say, well, why not? Why would Jesus stand for you in the next life when you reject Him in this life? You will be found guilty and you will be cast out. And the most horrifying words in the Bible were said by Jesus. He said they'll be cast into the outer darkness where there's a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The outer darkness, hell, a place of anguish, heartache, grief, suffering. Jesus, listen to me, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If we reject that light, we're cast into darkness. The one who rejects Christ will lose a chance for joy and blessing, fellowship, and left with nothing but darkness and regret. God will not be with you. So I'll end this way with a plea that you would go to Jesus. Call upon Jesus to be saved. The Bible speaks of massive amounts of people standing around God's throne and praising Him. And all that we do in eternity will mark, be marked by a sense of the presence of God and the consciousness that whatever we'll be doing will be an act of praise and thanksgiving to Him. God will literally be with us. In eternity, the details certainly are beyond our ability to comprehend or my ability to teach. But I know that when the time comes, we will stand together and we will have no regrets about following Jesus. And we certainly will not look back with longing for this life. No one's going to stand in heaven and say, oh no, I forgot my hat, I have to go back. Because it will be eternally more than we can imagine. God was with Joseph. In Christ, God is with us. In Christ, God will be with us. And ultimately, we will be with God. Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Our Lord and our God, we have no idea how much You are for us. And if we had but an inkling, we would not fear anything. Give us faith to see You as You are, and to trust You because You are good for that trust. We glorify you today and we ask your blessing upon us through Christ. Amen.